Good afternoon. My name is Martin Bert, and I come from, from Paraguay. I am very, very honored to be here with you. It's uh, not only a very prestigious university, but to come here and to honor Stefan schmidt heine is an act of justice in my personal case. I would also like to thank Bricio Biondi and Roberto Artavia from Avina Foundation, who sort of came into the wild in my little country and uh, for some mysterious reason thought that uh, it could have um, be good to support us, that we were <laughs> lost in the middle of nowhere. That is the truth. So I'm going to be very brief today, just uh, tell you a personal journey of uh, a group of uh, Paraguayans who refused to succumb to pessimism. This is a photograph, um, April 2008. As you know, Paraguay, like Brazil and Argentina, produce a lot of livestock and export a lot of livestock. I was mentioning to a group of friends today that Paraguay, who has six million people, exports food to feed 80 million people. Yet we have severe problems of extreme poverty and malnourishment. Any St. Gallen students want to work with me with that contradiction, I need your help. So I was I was a Burgenmeister, mayor of Asuncion, Intendente Municipal. And um, uh, Stefan Smithaini showed up one day and he says, hello, I'm Stefan Smithaini. Okay, very good. I sit down and look at like, him. How can I help you? And he said, I would like, well, nothing. How can I help you? And, okay, first person in the history of the city of Asuncion <laughs> that comes to the mayor to, <laughs> to offer help. And I, and, uh, I had uh, actually read a little bit about him and I was very interested in the idea of eco-efficiency. And uh, I said, you know, we have a serious problem in, 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 in Paraguay, and in Asuncion in particular. What? He says, our slaughterhouses to export beef to Europe and the United States and Russia and Chile, um, they are contaminating the rivers. When they wash, you know, I think one liter of blood contaminates, you know, something. And I said, you know that this is all protein that we're, you know, and so, what are you doing right now? He said, nothing. How are your shoes? He looked at his shoes, you yeah. know, fine. Want to come with me? So we went, Stefan smith Heine, Raul Gauto, <laughs> and me, went to this smelly place, and we saw the rivers of blood. And uh, what do you think? And Stefan smith Heine said, Small problem. Next year, with the Bertoni Foundation, we uh, created a hemoglobin and a plasma plant nine, eight, one year later, 1999. The investment was about 1.5. I don't know how much he put in the end, but uh, we, we found a, a Chilean uh, uh, private company. I was uh, trying to support a, a conservation company. And since then, 114 million liters of blood have been transformed into hemoglobin and plasma. And the conservation foundation that benefits from this investment has been able to save Paraguay's last Atlantic forest, where the last jaguarete, the jaguars, live. So eco-efficiency on top of eco-efficiency on top of eco That is Stefan Schmidt Heine from my little humble point of view. So even though he's not here, I want to pay homage to, to him because every once in a while you do see a visionary, a person who says, hey, let's do it. And um, I would just look very briefly, we don't have that much time. Um, I am in, involved in, in social entrepreneurship, um, very fascinated with, with, uh, with, with the idea of microfinance. The idea of microfinance, in my humble opinion, is brilliant. And 
it makes me so happy because if, look at this potential. How old is this profession? It is as old as prostitution, right? Right? To sell, I mean, is this like Baghdad, Babylonia? Did, is this what Alexander the Great found when he went into Tehran? <laughs> yeah. And yet, she was worth nothing until she was redefined as a micro-entrepreneur about 40 years ago. And once she is, oh no, she's a useless street vendor, a nuisance in the street. No, she's a micro-entrepreneur. Oh, really? Oh, so we can give her a loan. She can repay the loan. She can, um, we can do micro-insurance. She can open a, open a savings account. She, we can strengthen her precarious job. We can uh, create new jobs. We can increase her family income, all because we changed one name. And so I have been toying with that idea, and this is, what is wrong with this picture? What can we change the name here? Because right now, it is a typical rural Paraguayan family. And um, what we have done is take the idea of microfinance and see, well, if it works for microfinance, why does it work? Because microfinance is not about finance. What is it about? That's the essence of converting that lady into something worth... What's the word? Dignity. Dignity. Ah! Oh! It's not about finance. No. Okay, so if it's about dignity, then you can use the ideas of microfinance in education, and just like a microfinance program supports itself perpetually, can you use it for education? And so we have done that. We have created financially self-sufficient schools for the chronically poor by using the ideas of microfinance. So we have schools that where there is theory, and then they do practice, and they sell the production, and this is theory, you know, break-even point analysis and practice, and then the professors say, okay, this is how money is made. And using um, all sorts of energy as a biodigester, and learning by doing. But learning by doing is a traditional European technical vocational thing. But we have added two things. Learning by doing, selling, and making money. I don't know about Switzerland, but in, in Paraguay, if you tell the students, would you like to learn how to make money? They raise their hand. Zero dropout rate. <laughs> and so education is fun when there is money. And... Um, this is graduation. So how can you have this dignity of farmer girls from extremely poor families? Actually, this is graduation day, and of the 15 businesses on campus, one belongs to the student, and they, they pay for their gala, dinner, and graduation dignity. And so by, I became very curious. How, what is the process of people floating out of poverty? What, what happens inside? What happens outside? What is the process? What happens? And uh, we created a, uh, a network of uh, some 50 organizations right now who are practicing, and this works in Tanzania and South Africa and in India, and, and it just education can pay for itself. It's, uh, and we're, we're also uh, doing... Schools that are completely paying for themselves, and also business clubs. And it works in Morogoro, and Jombe, and Tanzania, just like everyone else. There is nothing more powerful than a 16-year-old girl who wants to have fun in school and make some money. And so, quickly, give me your answer. Why doesn't she have any teeth? First, first thing to your head. Can't brush your teeth. She has no money. She doesn't want to. (laughs) 
She cannot afford the doctor. Exactly. So there's many things, right? So what if we had a model to take all your ideas and make some useful lists? So we have the integral approach. We do, is it her behavior? Raise your hands, who is behavior? Or is it the system? <laughs> I knew it. Or is it culture? Or is it her personal intention? And so these are external. These are internal. You cannot see them. Those above are individual. And these to the bottom are collective. So with this idea, why doesn't she have a house? Why doesn't she have a latrine? Why don't you have water? Why don't you have public transportation? Why? Let's ask why. Why? And we don't know how to ask why, and much less do we know how to ask the interested party. And this is why the university is very powerful, because we need... And so basically, who are the poor? How are we going to address it? Are they empty bottles that we fill in with conditional cash transfers and grants? Or do they have money inside? Do you give them money or do you take the money from inside? We are betting on this strategy. And it sounds corny. I know it does. But it's an idea. Remember the idea? So it's, what if I define you? As a, what if I say to you, you have all the money in the world inside. And we, 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 we work from that idea. We, we, we think that idea. And so basically, what is poverty? We think that poverty is the three things, basically. To the right, poverty and land titles. Hernando de Soto was here yesterday. Brilliant. Okay? This is true. But it is not the only truth. There is also the Millennium Development Goals, right? And also money, right? In Nigeria, 300 Naira per person per day. In Paraguay, 3.5 US dollars per person per day. A family of four needs to make $14 a day not to be poor. Multiply times 30, that's $420 a day for a family of four not to be poor. In, in Switzerland, what is it? 30,000 Swiss francs for a family of four, 40, well, it doesn't matter. But every country knows what it is not to be poor in that country. What it is to be poor and what it is to be very poor across different sections. And so this is how we see poverty in my country. In my country, it's government will do poverty alleviation and the business sector and economic growth and government buildings is, you know, right? This is the strategy. I don't know about here, but this is basically it, right? And what is the elephant in the room? This is World Bank. This is, right? What is the, elef what is the elephant in the room? The poor. And the poor are not invited to this dialogue because we don't know, we don't know how. It's not that we don't care. How do you consult with 3 million or 30 million Brazilians? How? Today with technology, that problem has disappeared. Remember what this gentleman was saying about the telephone and see the forest in Indonesia? Today with technology, we can revisit all our paradigms that we discarded a long time ago because it was impossible. Now we can, hey, can, can we go back to 1959 and talk about integrated rural development programs that failed because coordination was impossible? But today, maybe. And so this is what we propose. Not alleviate, not reduce, eliminate poverty. Let's embrace it. What does it cost to solve the problem? What are we talking about? What is the gap? If the family is making $300 and they should be making $420, it's only $120 per family. There is not a family in the world that cannot be trained to earn an additional $120 in one or two years. If you believe that the family is trainable. 
And so, Michael Green, is he still here? So the, 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 this is the yin and the yang of the social progress index, okay? Social progress index, multidimensional poverty index, you take indicators and you aggregate, okay? Why? Because policymakers need a fast number. What are we talking about, says the president? Mr. President, we are number 38 and I think that we should go to number 52. Good. Okay? Policymakers need a summary information of all the information that the central bank has, Ministry of Health has, Ministry of Agriculture, right? How do you, right? Indexes and rankings are, are good. But for the poor, maybe a dashboard is good. So, in, because the corn cob of poverty is impossible to eat. But the kernels, and because we have technology, and so basically, we, we have a multidimensional poverty uh, uh, approach, all these dimensions, and we, we work with, uh, with groups of women, but we're also working with factory workers and um, with private companies, and we're also working in rural Nigeria and understanding what it is not to be poor, to be Fulani in northeastern Nigeria when you're Muslim and you have four wives. And um, we have I turned the six dimensions into 50 indicators, and each indicator, each indicator with a tablet, with a little phone, with, with just, you know, three photographs. What kind of water do you have? In one second. And by selecting the photo, next, next. You select, and in 20 minutes, you have your own customized identity. Uh, um, right? What is green in Paraguay is not green in Nigeria. And so you turn this poverty diagnosis, right? right? This is a, a typical Paraguayan family, right? No. Remember Ana Karenina, Leo Tolstoy? How does it start? Bricio knows. Who knows? <clears throat> All happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in their own way. Remember? Each poor family is poor in their own way. Before it used to be that that complicated matters. That is what makes it easy. You are different. Your combo is different from his. You only have problems because you're like me, four eyes, right? And, and then you may have a problem of income and you may have a problem of, of housing, but he, your next door neighbor, has the same problem of glasses, but he does not have a problem of a housing, he has a problem of water and transportation. And so this poverty stoplight becomes a customized plan, and then you can Google map it. <laughs> and then that's it. So you go to this typical rural, rural village in Paraguay, and you just ask them, do you live in a safe, unsafe, or very unsafe house? Clicky. And that's a map. And the index would not have solved this because there are pockets of insecurity in a village. And so what we do is, for every indicator, we work with the theories of Albert Bandura from Stanford University. He's a psychologist that tries to go beyond Skinner and saying that it's, it's more than rewards and punishments, it's people learn when they think they will learn. It's like me with French. <laughs> and so is it worth it has to do with motivation? Can I do it has to do with skills? And you, 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 um, you work and then you develop a plan. We're working with 18 countries, but we need help from St. Gallen to adapt new countries and combine these things and to help people move from that latrine to this latrine, to this bathroom, and that girl and that boy into this kind of personal transformations for every family. Just like the environmentalists can have an app to see what happens in each forest of the world. Hey, why not each, for the same effort, why not each family? But it's like if the forest has the telephone. <laughs> It's the, it's the poor family crowd 
uh, sourcing their information. And um, this is a, a poverty example for a community. And then we, we inventory uh, different uh, programs, and we have plans. And we have done some statistical analysis. This is, for example, a difference in difference with and without before and after statistical analysis. And we have found, uh, measuring with comparison groups, that uh, even though groups that do not do the poverty stoplight also get out of poverty, those with a poverty stoplight get out faster. And um, we have also worked with a social progress index to, to move and see how uh, the two results are. So we are very happy to be able to work with a social progress index because then we can inform governments what the people believe. Not only ask the Ministry of Health, is there vaccination, but <laughs> what the people say. And that is not mutually exclusive. Um, and um, so we have now 18 countries and, and it works really easy. I'm really amazed how the South Africans in the townships in Cape Town get it like that. Because there is a South African definition of what it is not to be poor. What it is to be poor and what it is to be very poor. And um, we're doing uh, competitions among the poor. Now that we have information, we just launched a, comp a pilot program. The competition is called My Bathroom, My Kitchen, My Pride. We asked the poor, identify your neighbor with the worst bathroom. <laughs> Take a photograph. Put it up in Facebook. Work for six months, get another photograph, put it on Facebook, if, and then we'll have a competition of likes. The prize is $1,000 savings account for a village bank and $200 for the family that wins. We mobilized some 6,000 families. And this lady won. And she was not poor in income but she had that latrine. That was her poverty stoplight. That's income over there. She was, had a problem there. And we're also doing that with, we, we now launched the Poverty Elimination Youth Olympic Games of students doing the poverty stoplight to their parents. There is nothing more powerful. <laughs> Again, that 16-year-old girl, Mom, uh, do you have savings account? <clears throat> no, red. Mom... <laughs> Uh, do you have autonomy to make decisions? Well, yellow, okay? <laughs> and then the students compete. Who gets their parents out of poverty first? Because poverty used to be a corn cob that nobody understood. But you know what? The poor get it. And because nobody's poor in everything, if you're poor in something, your next door neighbor is a positive deviant who should not have a modern bathroom, who does? So this is, mom, when are you going to get a health insurance? No tengo tiempo. Mom, I really need to win the contest. I don't have time. I don't have money. Mom, come on. Or this father says, can I speak with a manager here? <clears throat> what is this thing that you're forcing us to have a good bathroom now? We didn't do it. It's a school activity. So this is a savings account. And so some things have to do with changing the system, but not everything has to do with changing the system. We have to change the system. We have to change culture. We have to change personal behavior. And we have to tell people that it is possible to change their personal intention. And you know what? The good news is every indicator has four faces. So, I want to thank you very much for this opportunity to share this. As you can see, it's a clumsy tool. We're working with Hewlett Packard in the software, but we need ideas, we need St. Gallen professors, we need students, we need to see, um, we need to do it with the Roma in Europe, we do need to do it with the migrants in Europe. They know what it is not to be poor, what it is to be poor, and what it is to be very poor. And we need your help. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Bricio, Roberto, and Stefan, <laughs> thank you very much for this opportunity. It's been, it's been great. Thank you.